Yeah, and Abby was saying, so I, at one point I had software that would allow you to put the slide next to a little tiny version of yourself. Rather, so the slide was actually full, like most oh, of the screen. The I kind of like it this way. One, because I don't, I'm not redistributing the figures that I'm probably not allowed to put on YouTube. <laughs> like I'm only giving a low res diagonal version of them, so it's, you know, right. but you can go grab the slides and follow along yourself and go back and forth, which might, might actually be better. I don't know. How's everybody doing? Homeworks are still in progress. Did you eventually figure out what I was getting at? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Right. I'll put up an answer key as soon as I get all of them in. There's, I'm still waiting on a couple. So when I get them all in, I'll put up an answer key so that you can look at that for tomorrow's thing. Even though, even if you didn't follow the details carefully, the point is you can use the details next week when I pr show you what the, what the pieces are. So you can follow that same set. Does that make sense? All right. So we got a lot of stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about another force balance this time. And it's really, in interesting ways, it is very similar to the Ekman balance in that like the forces are going this way, and the flow is going that way, and the Coriolis force is going this way. But um, it has a very different locale in the water column that it's important. And we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about how you relate the transports by the Ekman, and that's particularly the convergences and divergences of the Ekman transport, and how they set up a pressure field, or ultimately we'll get to it them being a vorticity field, which is the right way to think about the, the, these gyre transports. So, but that probably doesn't mean anything to you right now. So anyway, oh, I will say, so this is the last um, piece that we're going to really be drawing out of Wunsch chapter 3 in. There's chapters 8 and 9 in Wunsch which talk broadly about lots of things that are all in geostrophic balance, eddies, currents, whatever. Um, so t varying in time and steady in time. They're good chapters to kind of skim through, but we're not going to go into detail into what's in these chapters. So, you know, skim quickly through those. We'll pick up again in kind of detail following along the same threads that are in lunch when we get to chapter 10. So that's the sequence. And then after spring break, we're going to start on waves, which will go back to chapter 4 and fill in the pieces that we missed in this jump from 3 to 8. Okay? <laughs> so we're, we are cycling through. We will go through the whole book, all of the topics in sequence. It's just not in this. I didn't, I didn't make this this sequence of ideas before Wunsch wrote his book. I might have taken his style, but I kind of like actually that we do a lot of large scale circulation stuff before spring break, then we come back from spring break and we do something totally different for a while. So it kind of changes the thread of the class. But we'll be building up on the geostrophic and Ekman transports and what they do in the gyres and how to understand that virtually up till spring break. Then when we come back, we'll switch to new topics after like El Nino and wave. All right, so first of all, are there any questions that are burning in your mind? All right, feel free to interrupt if you like. Um, so we're gonna go through the review of balances because we're gonna start and we're gonna, I just went back to add the review of balances into the beginning of the slide. So I want this to, the degree to which this is an important aspect of what we're thinking about should be every class we're starting with this until these become really like ingrained in your head. That's the real takeaway for this. Then we're going to talk about how geostrophic balance relates to the Ekman balance. So this force diagram is even simpler. And then we'll talk about a couple of different cases of geostrophic balance. What does geostrophic balance look like when the density is constant in the fluid? What does it look like in the barotropic case, which is a technical term that frequently gets confused with this constant density case. And they're similar from this perspective. And then bear clamp part. And then we're going to talk about this kind of obscure PDE's topic of superposition of linear solutions. But you'll see why I have chosen to emphasize the topics I've chosen to at this stage. So we're going to get to there. OK. So we have been doing this kind of tacitly all along, 
when we say, well, this term is big and this term is big, we can be a little bit more explicit. We take our equations of motion, we estimate the sizes of what's going on. So think of like a depth scale, a velocity scale, a horizontal length scale, a time scale. And these aren't true values. It's kind of like, I'm thinking about the Gulf Stream. So this might be 500 meters. This might be one meter a second. This might be 100 kilometers. This might be a couple years. And then you can go through the rest of the process to see what terms come out. So every term in the equation then, so these things, if you have a gradient in the horizontal, it would involve L's downstairs. If you have a gradient in the vertical, it would involve an H. If you have a velocity, the Coriolis parameter, you just stick them in there. If you have a DDT, it would be a time scale. So each of the terms you convert into a, something like this. Um, then you scale all the terms in the equation by these scaling, and then you collect together all the dimensions in one place. So you might just say, the Coriolis term is my important term. Let's compare everything else to the size of the Coriolis term. So it makes all the terms dimensionless in funny little ratios of these guys. And then the size of those dimensionless quantities will tell you how big you expect those terms to be in an outside of a particular measurement strategy with like feet or meters or whatever. So getting it to dimensionless means that it will be, the technical term is dynamical similitude. Once you have this, once you have the dimensionless parameters matched in your numerical model versus the real world or in your lab text versus the real world, you're solving the same equation even though they might be on a different physical scale. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's an important concept that goes into this. So we talked a bunch of, about a bunch of things like the Rossby number, the temporal Rossby number, the Eckman number, Reynolds number. These are examples of some of these dimensionless parameters that pop out. And so let's just look at what the, all the, so here's our momentum equation, which is the one that we're usually worried about for the scaling because it's got a lot of terms in it, so we'd like to get rid of some of them. So this one has a velocity over time, so it would be velocity over time. This one has two velocities and a gradient, so velocity squared over length. This one has Coriolis and velocity, Coriolis and velocity. This one has pressure, length, density. This is kind of a weird one, but I'll, I'll talk about that in more. Gravity is just as big as gravity is. And this one is the viscosity, whether it's an eddy viscosity like we talked about last time or molecularly, you could try both and see how big it is. And then vel velocity scale over it could be vertical, it could be horizontal. You should check both and think about it, okay? And so if you divide through by the size of this term, this term will have size one, because it's as big as itself. This term will be size Rossby, temporal Rossby, question mark, question mark, <laughs> Eckman. So we haven't given these names. You could think of G over FQ and um, that's actually a Froude number, which is a relationship of a gravity wave, it's sort of a Froude number, <laughs> um, to a rotation frequency. Um, but it doesn't matter that these don't have names. The question is, is whether they're big or not. Okay, this one is an interesting one because the pressure responds to whatever else is going on in the equation. So suppose this is small, this is small, this is small, this is small, we tend, but we've got an order one Coriolis parameter. What's the problem with that? Like imagine an equation where this is basically zero, this is basically zero, this is basically zero, this is basically zero, and that's zero, but this is order one. Doesn't make sense, right? It says one equals zero. So frequently what happens and what we will see is that the pressure get pressure gradients get as big as they need to be to balance that term. <coughs> so this, if this is small, this is small, this is small, the pressure will typically be the same size as the Coriolis parameter, pressure gradient four. And that's actually the geostrophic balance. So that's the one we're gonna come down to. 
And this one is a little weird because it acts on the vertical. So what's the balance between those two? Hydrostatic. So that's another example where the gravity is actually a really, really big acceleration. So nothing else in the equation is big enough to balance it. So the pressure accumulates until it comes into balance. Okay, so Taylor Proudman has these three in it. So that's interesting. And we could think of it in terms of all of our dimensionless parameters. Inertial oscillations, these two, that's the, the ratio. So we've gone through all these already, so I'm going to go through them quick. The Ekman layer, Coriolis balances friction. And you can think of it in terms of small, small, Ekman number is order one. And we don't worry about the pressure and the gravity. We're going to kind of get a, a handle on that later today. Hydrostatic balance, this guy. And so inertial oscillations again, hydrostatic balance again. The other problem is, why do I always end up repeating some of this? Anyway, <laughs> I cut and paste them because I'm really focused on them being there, but then I don't pay attention to them coming in later. Okay, here's our Ekman layer, which is this force balance that we said. So there, wind blows in this direction. The depth integrated Ekman transport goes per perpendicular to the wind so that the Coriolis force acting on the Ekman transport can balance the wind. That would be a stable situation. Why do we know that the Ekman layer is close to the top? That's where the wind stress is, but how do I know that the Ekman layer doesn't fill the whole depth? What parameter controls how deep the Ekman layer is? The viscosity or the Ekman number. So in order to be in an Ekman balance, Coriolis has got to be as big as the friction. So you got to have an Ekman number that's order one. An Ekman number goes like viscosity, steady viscosity, whatever that is, Coriolis, whatever that is, and then some H. If the viscosity was really small, H would get really small along with it. When you crank through these numbers for a typical situation in the ocean, with the amount of eddy viscosity you get from the amount of typical wind mixing that you get, turbulent mixing, you find that the Ekman depth is much less than the depth of the ocean. So this, where this is order one doesn't span the whole of the ocean. So friction is only important up there near the surface. Okay. To everybody. This one, um, if you were in honey, the Ekman depth would be the whole depth. So it really depends on how big the viscosity is. Okay? Yeah. I mean, when, oh yeah, sorry, Ekman depth is when Ekman number is one, what's the H that makes that happen? So it's basically the square root of viscosity over X. Sometimes people put a factor of two in because the Ekman spiral has one that has a factor of two in, but that doesn't really matter. The point is, is that it's like where the friction could possibly balance the Coriolis. Okay. Well, I said this last time, but I want to show you guys how to do it. Just you might. So if you look at this, where the Coriolis balances the wind friction, you might say, well, what direction does the velocity go in? And you can draw this little figure and figure it out. <laughs> or you can actually do a little bit of vector calculus using the triple product identity. So if S cross VE is in the direction of the wind, I can just cross it with another S to see what happens. Now I have S cross S cross VE. And then I use this triple product formula to tell me that this is equal to something in the direction of S, F dotted into the velo Ekman velocity. So which direction is F going? Vertical. So this is zero, because the Ekman flow is horizontal, that's vertical. So that term you don't have to worry about, but here's an interesting one. This is in the direction of the Ekman velocity times just the magnitude of F squared. So rearranging this force balance, it tells me that the Ekman velocity is in the direction of F crossed into the wind with a minus sign. So the 
Ekman velocity is in the direction of F, which is vertical, crossed into the wind that way, but with a minus sign that way. Okay? So, or you could write it just F, the wind force can cross Z, by just switching the order of those, canceling the magnitude of F with that. So, the cross product, if you switch the two, it gains a minus sign, right? So, I can rearrange this by putting F second, getting rid of the minus sign, and then I can cancel the magnitude of F with one of the downstairs ones, and that's a different way of writing the Ekman velocity. Does everybody see? Yeah? What if the F um, only be vertical at the center? Yes. All right, so this is part of the tangent plane approximation that we talked about. Yes, there is really an F that's aligned with the two omega, that's the rotation of the planet. But in the tangent plane approximation, one of the approximations that we goes into that we, is called the traditional approximation, just to make it really overly vague, is that you just reorient the, the rotation axis into the local vertical. And the reason why that works is because there's normally stratification or something that means that those other components of the Coriolis force aren't very big. So really, you can just pay attention to the one that's rotating about the vertical axis. When you get into interesting small scale, submesoscale flows where there's interesting, complicated stuff, then it can actually matter. So, but in large scale oceanography, where most of the motion is roughly parallel to the surface of the planet, that's not a bad approximation. Okay? All right, now let's talk about geostrophy. So, we can compare our little force diagram from Ekman. <laughs> I can just change all the words on it, and it's still the same diagram. <laughs> so, if I have high pressure here and low pressure here, the pressure gradient force, so flow wants to go from high to low, right? So essentially the high pressure is pushing the stuff away from it toward the low. So the pressure gradient force is taking the role, play, taking the role of our wind stress here. It's a force in that direction, okay? In order to balance that with a Coriolis force, I need to have a flow that is perpendicular to both the Coriolis force and that pressure gradient force. So the geostrophic flow is to the right of the pressure gradient force, which because the pressure gradient force is minus the gradient of pressure, it is to the left of the pressure gradient, <laughs> which is a little hard to remember. And then the Coriolis force is to the right of that in the center. So if we're looking at our but, so this is now a balance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. How big was the Coriolis term in our scaling? One. Yeah, so this is F times U, which we said was one. And then the pressure gradient is as big as it needs to be to balance that. Also one. So it's also one. So this argument that we had before about the Ekman number being small and it was surface trapped doesn't apply anymore. So we can have geostrophic flow in any depth we want. We go all the way down to the bottom. There's no longer a vertical scale that's obvious from the scaling. So the schematic, keep in mind, if you have an Ekman flow near the surface, it's superimposed on a geostrophic flow that spans lots of depths. Okay? So we'll continue to push on that and, we'll, and you'll start to see like what's the expectation for how deep that thing goes? What's the expectation for, it has to do with a lot of large scale complicated balances, but we're gonna build toward that as we start to understand how the gyres work. Okay? But from the force diagram, it's similar. Okay? We're still talking about a Coriolis force with this F cross. So we could do the same little triple product game and write down this which is that the geostrophic velocity is z hat cross the pressure gradient over f. And there should be a row. Sorry. I'm missing a row from over there. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. All right. Sal. <laughs> but all right, so there's high pressure and there's low pressure. Where does the pressure come from? How do we figure out what the pressure is in the beginning? It's got to be there if there's a flow, and that flow is going to be balanced with something. But like, if I just put a Coriolis force in, I might get a inertial oscillation instead of a pressure gradient force to balance. Like, where does it, how does that all work? Does that make sense to everybody? Like, where like. The pressure gradient force is big enough to balance the flow we observe, but there's no like DDT in this relationship. Like if it was it wasn't in balance, then what happens? So maybe a different way to think about this is not there is a velocity there and thus there must be a pressure gradient force, but to say what caused the pressure gradient and then think about what velocity is involved in that. And since this doesn't really have a cause and effect, they're just there together in balance. We can read it either way. We can say the current causes the pressure gradient, or the pressure gradient causes the current. They're not, e neither of them is more correct than the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're looking very <laughs> doubtful. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Like, what if there, so the, so you, if you put flow into a system, would you get a pressure gradient? So this is one of the oddities of this whole game of like taking a, force, a set of forces. This is what the real system is paying attention to. If we go in and say, well, this is as big as that, so they're in balance. It doesn't tell you anything about if they weren't in balance, then they would adjust and do something more interesting. So you kind of need the whole system to solve the time dependent problem. So when we go in and say this balance is that, it's not the whole, it doesn't tell us how it got there. It just says the forces are comfortably in balance. So it's like kinetics versus statics in, in first year physics. So when you build a bridge, it's got lots of forces and they're all in balance because the bridge isn't accelerating, right? It's just sitting there. But you shoot a cannonball and it's accelerating <laughs> because the forces are not in balance, so it accelerates. And so this, Geostrophic balance, Ackerman balance, are a, the equivalents of a bridge. They are a static balance. There are no, it's not accelerating anymore. It's just comfortable with what it's doing. It's a little bit more obscure than that since the Coriolis force, as we know, is really actually part, it's a fictitious force, so it is part of the acceleration, the rotational acceleration, because of the rotation of the planet. So it's not quite fair to call it static, because it's not static, it's rotating. So it's not inertial, so it's a weirder system. But that's a, that part of it is that same odd thing of like when the bridge breaks, you don't know what's gonna happen based on the analysis of the static force thing. You have to then go back to the beginning, bring the DDT curves in and solve for the, for the kinetic solution, the dynamic solution. Okay, but we're gonna get there anyway. We're gonna think hard about where the pressure gradient comes from physically, and then that's gonna be revealing as to how to understand the system, and it will, then we'll start to think about spinning up and how the whole thing gets going. Okay. One place where we have a different balance for the pressure, also a diagnostic balance, but maybe this is more appealing to our in intuition, is the hydrostatic force. So I can solve the hydrostatic force by just integrating in Z. We've done this a lot. And so the weight above you per unit area gives you the pressure. So what if you have an anomalous amount of weight above you? Then you're anomalously high pressure, and that's gonna cause a pressure gradient force with your horizontal environment, and then you might have a geostrophic flow associated. So there's one case in particular that we might really want to, sorry, this is the faded version of that. One case in particular you might want to see is the back to the pillows and bricks. So I've got a weight anomaly if I'm here because my sea surface height is taller. 
So I've got a taller stack of bricks. So where is the high pressure here? In the center. <coughs> and then we said that down here it is actually could be compensated by this downward part. But let's just focus on the high pressure. So if we have a high pressure here, which way does the pressure gradient force push? Out of the out of the middle. <laughs> so which way does the Coriolis force need to push to keep it in balance with that pressure gradient force? So that I put a hail of water in the middle and it doesn't just run away. I want a Coriolis force to hold it there. Which way does the flow have to go to make that balance happen? It's going to go around and around the loop. And it's going to go around and around the loop in which direction? It's going to go around and around the loop in the northern hemisphere. It's going to go around and around the loop clockwise so that the Coriolis force, which is always to the right of the motion, is pushing back uphill, pushing that water back up into the pile. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm do so this is a nice schematic from Collins' book. It always spells correct as the Collins. Sorry, it is Collins whenever it looks like it. <laughs> the name, it won't let me type the name of the author. <laughs> it keeps changing it. So here's exactly, here is exactly that situation. We have high pressure being encircled by a flow and the Coriolis force is pushing back into the high pressure. We could have a low pressure anomaly and then we need to balance it by having the Coriolis force pushed everywhere outward. And then the flow would go the other direction in order to have that. Okay, does anybody know when, you, when a storm starts, is it a high pressure or a low pressure anomaly? Like in the atmosphere. Like when you watch the barometer to know when the storm is coming, does the pressure go down as the storm hits or does it go up as the storm hits? Down. It does go down. <laughs> so for this reason, a low pressure anomaly is referred to as a cyclone. Because when a, a cyclone has a low pressure anomaly in its center, and so this sense of rotation, where the Coriolis force is consistently pushing out to balance the pressure gradient force from a low pressure anomaly is called cyclonic, in the direction that a cyclone would go. So cyclonic in the northern hemisphere is, in this direction, counterclockwise. Anticyclonic <coughs> in the northern hemisphere is clockwise. So a cyclone is always a low pressure, and an anticyclone is always a high pressure. In the other hemisphere, southern hemisphere, a cyclone goes the other way, but it's still cyclonic. Okay? So a cyclonic wind in the southern hemisphere goes clockwise, and an anticyclonic wind goes counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. The other way you can remember this is that a cyclone rotates the same direction as the pole for the hemisphere it's in. So a pole, the sun is rising in the east, it's setting in the west. So the north pole is going this way. <laughs> and, and so a cyclone is also going that way. In the southern hemisphere, the sun still rises in the east, <laughs> it sets in the west, but a cyclone is going this way in order to match up with that, so it goes the other way. Okay? So we'll start using cyclonic and anticyclonic the same way we use equator word and pole word, and just like north and south, clockwise and counterclockwise get shuffled up depending on where you are, but equator word and pole word might be more meaningful for cyclonic and anticyclonic, or just high pressure and low pressure. Okay? Um, looking from the side, you might start to wonder about how this, you know, is there diverging flow? Is there converging flow? Is the picticline coming up? So here's the low pressure anomaly, which there they have written surface divergence on to make you think maybe 
the excellent flow is diverging at the surface, you might get a low pressure anomaly when that occurs, the picticline would come up. Why does the picticline come up? Yeah, so that the pressure gradients down deep are canceled out. That's so this is a short stack of pillows next to two tall stacks of pillows so that the brick pile in the middle is taller, which tends to compensate for the low pressure due to sh the sea surface height anomaly. And then over here is the one we're normally drawing. This is the tall stack of pillows next to the short stack of pillows with the bricks on the bottom in order to cancel it out that way. Okay, good. Okay, so where did the pressure come from? Version two. We just said that you might think about pressure coming from sea surface height anomalies, a low or a high. Let's think about that for a minute. What is that? If the ocean has constant density, which it sort of does, it's the first order, right? How much, what percentage of change is there in density from fresh water to seawater? Three to four percent, yeah, right around there. So it's relatively constant. Let's just ignore the small variation in density for now and just say it's constant density. To think through what geostrophic flow looks like in constant density fluid, which is, which is simpler than with, the, with variations in density. Okay, so constant density, here's the surface, and underneath, we'd expect the isobars, that is the lines of constant pressure, to align themselves with the surface. Why is that? Yeah, so this height of water weighs as much as this height of water. So to have the equivalent weight above you per unit area, that is your pressure and hydrostatic balance, the pressure is gonna acu have accumulated the same amount per unit distance from the surface depth. So the isobars should align themselves with the surface. So the pressure gradient at any Z level is what? The horizontal pressure gradient at any fixed depth. It's density times, the pressure is density times gravity from before, sorry I meant the What's the difference in pressures between here and here versus here and here versus here and here? Well, that one doesn't count because it's not in the water. But it should be the same. We can, because they're the same weight, the same relative amount of weight. Like, I've got more pressure at both points, but it's the same amount more as it was there. Okay? So the calculus version of this, as we integrate this thing in Z, starting at the surface and going down, and so our surface is a function of x and y, but not a function of z. So I can do this integral, and at any level z that I want, I say I go from the surface down to wherever I am, and this is the definite integral of that equation, from the surface down to whatever z I'm at. But look at this, this says pressure goes like rho naught g, so a background value of our constant density, times whatever the surface is, gives you all the x and y variation. And then I get more pressure the deeper I go. Okay? All of the pressure anomalies are from the variation of the surface in x and y in a constant density fluid, constant density hydrostatic fluid. Okay? So now, Tell me about the gradient of that pressure. What is it in the horizontal and what is it in the vertical? DDZ in the pressure is what? Everybody's just pointing. Yeah, all right, minus rho naught G, right? Same as the hydrostatic balance. So I take the Z derivative, but now what's DDX in the pressure? Careful. Eta dependent. This one doesn't. You're right about that, but eta dependent x. So I gotta. Rho zero g, z by dx. 
eighth. And the same is true in the line. balance with horizontal Coriolis forces. These are the ones that matter, not this one. We're taking the horizontal gradients of the pressure, but in the constant density case, it doesn't see the Z part at all. It just grabs onto the variations in the subsurface height. So the horizontal variations in pressure are set up by the horizontal variations in sea surface height, and they're the same at every depth. Okay, that's important. That just told us everything we needed to know about this force diagram. Okay, where does our high pressure come from? It comes from sea surface height high. Where does our low pressure come from? It comes from low sea surface height. It doesn't depend on depth. So the geostrophic flow, does it depend on depth? No, it's got to be constant. So this little cartoon that we drew of a constant, vertically constant geostrophic flow with an Ekman layer on top is actually a pretty good model for the constant density ocean with a wind and a pressure gradient that's only resulted from sea surface height variation. Okay? Or you can just write it this way. VG is Z hat cross, so if Coriolis force is equal to G cross the gradient of eta, horizontal gradient of eta here, horizontal velocity. Um, I can just plug in with, the, with, with that and I can come up with this. So VG is equal to Z hat cross the gradient of eta over F. Doesn't depend on Z. This doesn't depend on Z, this doesn't either. That's what it's going to be at every depth. Okay. Um, we actually have not done anything that violated the Taylor Proudman theorem in our derivation of this. Taylor Proudman was existed. We don't have it got because we're outside of the Ekman layer. We're thinking about that internal geostrophic flow. It was low Rossi number. We're still low Rossi number because we threw away the DDT. So we just kept this. And it was, um, well, that's it. That's all we needed <laughs> for Taylor. Oh, a constant density. So we did the constant density case. So um, what that means is that this is just our DBDZ. That's the same thing as that the flow travels around in columns. It doesn't tip over. That's the same. This flow also travels around in columns. It doesn't tip over doesn't tip over in this case because there's no z dependence on the right hand side but it was consistent with all the all the derivation of taylor problem we did before so in a constant density ocean low rossby number we expect taylor columns cruising around why are they moving well they're moving because there's a sea surface height variation to go with them and that's providing pressure gradient forces that are in balance with geostrophic flow So let's look at our tank, one more, our tank movie for the umpteenth time. All right, what has he just done when he stirred it? He put sea surface height variations in. Now you put that at this end. It's shooting around. It's not shearing over, at least not the part, except for the blobs, which are probably high Rossby number from the original squirt. But as it's spreading out, it's spreading out in columns. The columns are not tipping over. There are little inertial oscillations wobbling around that. But basically, this is the constant density. This is the way to think about the constant density case. OK? And now, if this tank is rotating this way, tell me, oops, it went too far. 
And you always have to start at the beginning. Like, I don't know how to fast forward. Ah! Okay, we can do it from here. This one is spinning that way. Is that a high or a low pressure? Is it spinning the same direction as the tank? <laughs> or the opposite direction of the tank? Wait, sorry, the tank's going this way. He, he was touching it and he was going that way. So the tank is spinning this way. <laughs> so that one is spinning this way. Is it the same direction or the opposite direction of the tank? Opposite direction of the tank. So is that a cyclone or an anti-cyclone? Anticyclone. Is an anticyclone associated with high pressure or low pressure? High pressure. That's a high. Similarly, this one is spinning same direction as the tank. What's the pressure right there? Why is the pre why is the pressure there? No, no. Why is the why why what what variable is governing the pressure at that point? The height. So there is a low anomaly in the surface here. There is a high anomaly in the surface there. There is a low pressure here. There is a high pressure here. There is a cyclone here. There is an anti-cyclone there. Okay? That's what geostrophic flow is all about. Okay? Or constant density geostrophic flow. Okay, yeah. So are those um, cyclones or anti-cyclones that are in the mass peak over time? Are those the things? Or I think it's the that's what this little cartoon is about. If the Coriolis force is actually in balance with that flow, what happens to that anomaly, high or low? It just sits there. So it turns out that that is not actually true in the real world. It can't totally sit there because the Rossby number is small but not zero. So a small Rossby number means that, then they've actually conveniently drawn it for us here, you have a little leakage outward. You don't quite go around in a circle. You might lose order Rossby number of the fluid from the interior of each circuit. So if the Rossby number is 1, 0.01, 1% of the fluid might leak out, 1% of the pressure anomaly might be reduced that kind of thinking. Put in another way, all those DDT terms that we neglected all wanted to shoot that high pressure downhill. So they're going to do that a little bit, just not as much as the Coriolis is going to spiral it around. So it's going to be a combination of the two. But to first order, forgetting the small terms, the hills stay put and they just have a circulation going around them and they just stay there. They actually shouldn't move, which is an interesting question about how the DDT terms work. They, they move a little because of the other terms. They shouldn't move just based on the geostrophic balance alone. In that, if it, they were perfectly symmetric, they would just sit still. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a stronger linkage between the sea surface height and the pressure field below than there is between like the height of the ionosphere and the pressure below for that reason. But now we're going to relax the assumption of constant density and we're going to start to see that there are corrections around that. So it is more in the, in the ocean as well as the atmosphere, there are variations of density that appreciably affects the pressure field below and makes makes it so that that taylor proudman theorem is violated to some extent. But first, we can generalize one simpler way, which doesn't go all the way to that limit. We can, instead of saying that dp z equals rho a constant g, we can do something called the barotropic. We can consider a barotropic fluid. A barotropic fluid is a fluid where the density is just a function of the pressure. So if I drew the density contours on here, they would be the same as the isotopes. So this is light fluid, this is denser, this is denser, this is denser. But it's the same density everywhere on this layer. 
same density everywhere on this side. Okay. So now it's a little bit harder to think about this equation because the density does vary in the distance. But how do my pressure, <laughs> how are my horizontal pressure gradients related with from here to there? So here to here versus here to here. They're still the same. Even though the density is decreasing from the surface down, it's decreasing in such a way that I just am accumulating the same amount of weight per year as I go down in depth. So what about the geostrophic flow in a barotropic ocean? Does it vary with depth? It doesn't, because the pressure gradient is the same in every depth. So <laughs> we can now say we're not in a constant density ocean, we're in a barotropic ocean. And everything we just said goes through again. taylor proudman theorem still applies. The constant geostrophic flow with depth still applies. The sea surface height being intimately related to the pressure, it still applies because the high pressure here is there within every layer at the same amount. That high is just getting communicated down and down. It's going down at a different rate than it used to in constant density ocean, but it's not changing its pattern. Okay, so the, pre the density anomaly is a function of the pressure anomaly, and the pressure anomaly is still only really generated by the horizontal variation in the depth. Okay? Any function. Even if it's not linear function, any function you want. It can have jump, stair, stair steps. You ha it has to be differentiable. But aside from that, it's not. It, it's any function because it's essentially that's the answer. I, I can calculate it this way. And I, I don't know what that integral is. It's something complicated, but the x and y variations are only coming from the this, not coming from there, because rho here is not a function of x and y. It's just a function of pressure. So this guy continues to be the same as it was. So it doesn't matter what the function is all of the x and y dependence are still coming from that boundary. Does that make sense? Well, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's really weird. But, and why barotropic would be an intermediate step. Barotropic is an intermediate step because this is the easiest thing to think about. This is sort of the most general density profile you can think of before things start to get complicated. So constant density looks an awful lot like barotropic ocean. Barotropic ocean does have density variations, but of a very dull kind. Okay, but we can play the same game, ha ha ha, we can do this geostrophic balance, it doesn't vary with z, we can write it the same way, we're now looking at gradients of that integral, which just come out to be the gradients of the sea surface height, so on, so on, so on, okay? So, same story again. And Taylor Proudman still applies. We can go through exactly the same machinery, come back to Taylor Proudman again. Okay, and here are some more schematics to remind you our discussion on the pool, on the tank, but <laughs> these are just reminders. So cyclones, anticyclones, this is northern hemisphere, this is southern hemisphere, which is, as you can see, the mirror image of <laughs> northern hemisphere because all the words are backwards. <laughs> but I just flipped it, okay? But I think you guys already have that. And here's another picture, which is just a visualization of that from a different book. All right, let's go through our balances again. Total momentum, inertial oscillation, Ekman layer, hydrostatic, geostrophic, Taylor Proudman, which has hydrostatic and geostrophic hiding inside. Okay, what if more than one of these balances is simultaneously occurring. What if a fraction of the Coriola is balancing D, 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 T, and another fraction of it is balancing pressure gain? Yeah. 
This is where linearity comes in. So let me, let's look at the equations first. So here's the big equation, except I throw out the nonlinear term. Throw out the d dot grad d. Our inertial oscillation is this balance. Some part of v, which I put a vi on, is just the inertial oscillation related v, and the Coriolis that's on that vi. Those are balanced. Ekman, the v Ekman, friction on the v Ekman. Geostrophic, Coriolis and geostrophic, pressure gradient. Let's add them up. VI plus VE plus VG. The DDT term is exclusively in the VI balance, but there's F cross VI in it. The VE is F cross, now VI plus VE, and it balances that term too. And the VG, F cross VI plus VE plus VG equals this term, this term, this term, this term. We just got the whole thing back. So we can write the equation. Oops, I thought I had it all written out. We can write the equation, and we can think about it, as long as the it, vective Rossby number is small, as being a superposition of these guys. So remember when I said in the tank, oh, look, it's geostrophic flow, but there's some inertial oscillation superimposed on top. That's exactly what I'm thinking, is I can add this plus that. Some small fraction of the velocity field is due to the wobble, and a big part of it is due to this. Also, in that tank, there certainly is an Ekman layer at the bottom, because it's dragging on the bottom of the tank, which is providing friction. But it doesn't interfere with the geostrophic motion or the inertial motion, it just adds to it. So as long as we stay in small advective Rossby number, we can just add together these force balances and think about the whole situation. And we can do it in the same in the vertical. We can think about Ekman layers, the top and bottom, and the geostrophic in the middle. We just add them together. So at every depth, we're just thinking, what about, I've got some fraction of my flow that's in this balance, some that's in this balance. If I take my model output, I could diagnose this part, and I could diagnose this part. I could add them together and see if it was the whole of the Coriolis force. That would tell me whether, where I was going to. Does that make sense? So just like in, you might have seen this in e &M or quantum mechanics, all linear field theories have this property. You can take different solutions and add them together and superimpose them on top of each other. And it's uh, practical. So what happens if, it, we, if we don't throw out the nonlinear term? <laughs> Worth thinking. OK, so suppose we have a nonlinear inertial balance plus a nonlinear Ekman balance plus a nonlinear geostrophic balance. The velocity will not add up to the three of those because we get these extra terms. Some part of it are canceled out, but they're all these crazy cross terms that are not canceled out. So all of this stuff is the reason why we can't do oceanography as simply as I just said. But in, in a numerical model, with small, and we diagnose the model, or the real world, we diagnose the advective Rossby number, and we say it's small, we know that these terms are there, but we think that they contribute a small amount to the solution. So we can play this game in our echo diagnosis and ask what balances are going on, and we can superimpose Ekman and geostrophy and understand a lot that's going on about the flow and know that this imbalance has to be there because the full equation has it, but we can ensure that it's probably going to be small because the Rossby number is small, which we can check before we even get started down this road. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's why I wanted to put these dominant balances in as the fundamental, because when we go to understand an oceanic flow, we start looking for things like this, we, s we can talk about it, we can understand what, you know, what caused that high pressure system, what caused that pile up of water, what caused the, w you know, the winds are going that way, which way is, gonna, is the flow gonna go? And we can add all those different flows together and end up with something that's quite close to the total except for this nonlinear part. But the nonlinear part we can find by going out in the world and measuring it or running a high resolution model that handles all those terms directly. 
Yeah. And I think this is a big change. Well, this is not a big change from the traditional way of doing this. The traditional way of doing this was these are the things you can solve, the iner not nonlinear, but the linear inertial Ekman geostrophic were the things you could solve with pencil and paper. And so people would just do it because they could do it with pencil and paper. And these were just unknowable. Nobody knew what to do with them. <laughs> Unless you would find like an exact solution that happened to be the perfect thing that all of the linear term, nonlinear terms actually canceled in just the right way, and you would have a few exact solutions that people spent a lot of time studying, because those were reflective of what these terms might do. But now, with computers, we can make as many nonlinear solutions as we want. They're just easy, you just push a button and they go. And so, we still think this way, because these pieces are easier to think about than the nonlinear pieces are. So diagnosing a model starts with the linear balances because they're easier to understand. But we have the ability to simulate the nonlinear system as, as uh, arbitrarily well, essentially. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> so, uh, for example, the wind stress. So the wind stress actually depends on the relative speed of the wind speed versus the surface ocean. It's not just a stress, it's like a stress that depends on that difference. So the geostrophic flow could actually be aligned with the wind and then that would cause that to be slightly smaller or it could be anti-aligned and that would cause it to be slightly larger. You could still get that through analysis of the boundary conditions on this term. You just have to be a little more careful. So they can be coupled through like the boundary conditions and things in a way they're just not non-linearly coupled. They're still linearly coupled. There is non-linear coupling among these in the boundary condition as well because the wind stress is not proportional to that velocity difference. It's proportional to that velocity difference squared. If you take that extra complexity into account, then you can't you can't just add them together again. But as long as all of the boundary conditions and all the field equations are linear in the approximation you're working with, you can just add them together. They might interact in lots of interesting ways through the boundary conditions or otherwise, but they, they will still be solvable. Yeah? What are the units for that um, specific thing? Oh, so this is meters per second, so there's a velocity, and this is two, and this is two, and this is two. <coughs> so everybody's a velocity over here. All right, you don't need to watch the movie again, but you can watch the movie again and you can start, but we can watch a different movie. Okay, this is a cool movie. This is now the same thing, except they've got a drain hole in the middle and a diffuser on the side. So what's that drain hole gonna do? It's gonna make the pressure low, so we're going to have a spiraling flow in, and there'll be Ekman flows and all kinds of stuff. So this is what that one does. So they're putting buoyant particle on the surface. It goes <laughs> down the drain. And look, it doesn't go straight down the drain. It goes around the drain cyclonically. Okay. This is a rotate. This is rotating. No, no, this is the Coriolis force. But this one is going, this is rotating really fast, unlike a toilet. So the Rossby number here is still small. <laughs> Even though, or not, the Rossby number is not that small because it doesn't go around loop de loop de loop de loop. It goes like less than one time before it goes down the hole. This is the toilet experiment done carefully. But you can't get it to go all the way around if they, would they need to rotate the tank faster or rotate the tank no. slower to get it to go oh, yeah. around? Are you rotating the tank? Yeah, it is. They're just not rotating it very fast. They're walking around. <laughs> yes. I believe they're rotating the tank. Slow rotate. Large Rossby number. Okay, now they're going to really rotate the tank. Fast rotation. Same problem. It flushes down the plug hole, but it doesn't, but it 
It doesn't go straight down, it goes around the loopy 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 loop. So this is what a cyclone is doing. A cyclone is a low pressure anomaly, but it takes it a long time for the particles to get to the middle, they just spin around and around and around. So when you look at a hurricane and you see the eye wall that's building and there's stuff, you can actually see a couple trajectories that are spiraling inward, but they don't, like some clouds will make their way in, but they don't, they go around a lot more than they go in. It's a, it's a small Rossby number setup. Embassy and the embassy has a special device that makes it go the other way, just to keep the Americans happy. Anyway, um, there are. <laughs> this is like one of the funny, a, a really fun thing to to Google. There are all these crazy websites about this, so it doesn't actually work in a real toilet because the jets or any residual. <laughs> rotation in the toilet will dominate the way that the flow goes out. So it's you have to do it in a more controlled circumstance or a very small Rossby number, a really rapidly rotating tank. So the tank experiment does it because they can rotate it fast. It wasn't so obvious at slow rotation. And at the slow rotation of the Earth, it's going to be a very large Rossby number. It's just going to go straight down. It's not going to go one way or the other unless 
the way the water enters the tank has a preferential rotation, which they tend to, unless you work very hard to eliminate them. Does that make sense? So that diffuser in that thing was all to eliminate it. Okay, <laughs> enough fun. Oh, there's in Kenya, which is there's a little town in Nanu called Nanyuki, and it's on the equator. And there's a a guy who takes tourists to one side, and then drains a plug hole out of a bowl of water, and then he goes to the other side and he drains it out. But there's a video which you can go see here, where he does it. He goes clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> Because he's because he's giving it like a shake as he pulls the plug, and he does it backwards. Anyway, <laughs> so um, anyway, there's a lot to see. Okay, last piece we want to talk about: what if the density varies in an interesting way, not barotropic? So, barotropic case is where the density is a function of pressure only. So this is barotropic. So our pillows are all in the same pressure levels, our bricks are all the same pressure levels. What if we just have a, a big stack of bricks next to a big stack of pillows? Then this is what's called a baroclinic circumstance. Baroclinic means that the baro, the isobars, are inclined with respect to the isopycnals, the surfaces of constant density. So density and pressure are like this and don't line up with each other. This is a good example because the pressure is increasing as we go down, but all my density is on one side and my pillows are on the other side. So I've got light. I have no, my density is not even a function of Z. My density is just a function of X. And my pressure is still a function of Z. Okay, so let's think about the pressure gradient force. So up here at the top, they start at the same height. Pillows are slightly higher than the bricks. They should be. Oh, they are. Haha, <laughs> look, I actually did it. It's only that far. And this is that far. Okay, good. So <laughs> the pillows, over, right underneath the, this, we have a lot of pillows and just like a tiny fraction of brick. So this is the high pressure side. Okay? So which way does the pressure gradient force push? From high to low. Right? So which way does the Coriolis force have to push? In the northern hemisphere, or in any hemisphere, green belt. It's got to push the other way. So which way does the flow have to go for that to occur? Out of the page. Okay, let's go to the deep part. Now the higher pressure is on this side, because we've got to match the southern bricks and dog woods to the tall stack of pillows. The flow goes into the page. So there is a shear. We are no longer in the Taylor problem of disease. The geostrophic flow is now going in opposite directions at the top and the bottom of the water column. Or pillow column, whatever it's called. <laughs> okay? So, let's go through the math of how that works and see, it, see that. So this is a relationship called the, the simplest case of that, of a baroclinic flow. The simplest thing to think about is something called the thermal wind. And it's the combination of geostrophy in the horizontal direction, as the force balance, and hydrostasy in the vertical balance, which is what we've been talking about all along, except now we're not going to make the additional assumption of constant density or barotropic density. Okay, here's that equation. Here's that equation. What if I just substitute dpdz into that equation by taking ddz of this equation. Take ddz of this equation, I get something that looks like that, which, this is the reason why this is a little bit harder than the other one. Dip. One part of this is ddz hitting the pressure, and one part of this is ddz hitting the density. Because of the Boussinesque approximation, we can neglect the second one. But let's think it through in a simpler way. How different is gradient of P over rho going to be if the density is 1% higher? 
at one location that you know. Not one percent higher. It'll be if density is one percent higher. This would be roughly one percent lower, right? How different is this going to be between pressures that are equal at the same depth and pressures that are one percent different at the same depth? It's going to be infinitely different because if the pressures are equal, the horizontal gradient of pressure is zero. Now you put a little change in the pressures from location to location, and the gradient is non-zero. So in some sense, the way to think about this ratio when the density variations are small is you really only need to worry about the gradient part varying in the horizontal, not this bottom part. So under that assumption, I can bring the DDZ in to act on just the pressure, which then, with this equation, is well, like this. So I assume that the downstairs density I can take as a constant, which is OK, approximation. That's this approximation. And the upstairs part is the part I care about, which is this is called the buoyancy in Buffonet fluids, this whole thing. This is the gradient of the buoyancy. So the buoyancy, so the buoyancy, is buoyant fluid is when it, compared to its environment, is anomalously less dense. It's buoyant, it goes up. <laughs> if it is anomalously dense compared to its environment, it goes down. So the buoyancy has the opposite sign of the density. Maybe it, this isn't the way you define it. Buoyancy is opposite sign of the density, so that because denser stuff tends to sink, and, and so you want when a density goes up, the buoyancy goes down, and vice versa. And then there's this rho naught rho naught g, so that this term gets simpler. <laughs> so it's these are just constants that you put in place to make this. That. Because now we can say, hey, the buoyancy gradient is telling us about the shear in the geostrophic flow, the vertical shear. Or playing our same game with the triple product, the shear in the vertical gradient is z hat cross the buoyancy over x. Let's go back to our little schematic. Or, hmm. So which side has buoyancy? On this, this is buoyant or not buoyant? Buoyant. buoyant. So positive buoyancy here, negative buoyancy here. So the buoyancy gradient is pointing this way and throughout the water column. So the negative buoyancy gradient is pointing the other way. So F cross BBDZ is going to give us this change in the volume. That's the DUDZ that we just got. Does that make sense? That's what we're doing. And why is this why is this an amazingly important relationship? Why can't I just go back to the pressures? Well, because I can actually go out in the world and measure the buoyancy. The buoyancy just depends on the density. It doesn't depend on the pressure. Why can't I independently measure the pressure as a function of Z? these little deviations in pressure. Remember our instrument, our reverse interferometers, and our CTD doesn't actually measure depth. It measures pressure. It's easy to measure the pressure. But we can't measure the pressure variation with depth independently of that. We just we don't know what depth we're at. We're in some weird depth, but we know what the pressure is. But because this approximate this thermal wind relationship makes the pressure go away, we can measure everything in this equation. So we can eva directly evaluate this equation, or if we don't happen to have an expensive instrument that measures velocities, we can just measure the buoyancy, just learn the temperature. So when we do a CTD cast, we have a vertical profile of buoyancy, and we can use that to infer what the geostrophic velocity is doing, which will go up and down and down. So in once there's a lot of discussion about this because this doesn't tell you what the velocity is at the surface. It only tells you what the relative velocity is. So 
you can shift the whole thing by a Taylor column, and this doesn't know anything about it. Because remember, the barotropic flow could be superimposed on this baroclinic chain. So we don't know what the barotropic flow is doing until we get more sophisticated with our observational techniques. In the modern era, we can measure the barotropic flow from satellites because we can measure sea surface height, gravity, lots of things like that from satellites. We can also just stick a mooring in at one depth and then measure the DVDZ relative to that spinning propeller on the mooring. Or we can um, try and close a like regional budget and it turns out that there are enough degrees of freedom constrained that it actually works in a region. So one should go through a lot of different discussions of this. In the modern era, it's not so important, but we do want to understand that this doesn't tell you the absolute velocity. It just tells you the change in the velocity of the jet. The absolute velocity, we could know that if we knew the pressure gradient, but we don't know the pressure gradient. We just know the buoyancy. That's the thing that's easily measured. OK, so let's look at this picture. And then a little bit more. So this is what, so here's a barotropic flow. The isobars and the isopixels are aligned. Here's the baroclinic flow. The isobars and the isopixels are not aligned. I don't even remember which they are. And so you have a sheared velocity. It's getting bigger as you go up in this case. Constant velocity at all depths in that case. So remember, here's our pressure gradient map at the surface from a model. And now, which ways do the flows go? There's high pressure. That's what, a cyclone or an anticyclone? An anticyclone, so it's going to go this way, following the, the, the isobars. And then in this hemisphere, it's going to go this way. So there's a gyre. There's another gyre. There's, that gyre is involved with the Curacao or the Gulf Stream. This one is involved with the East Australia Current. This one is involved with the Brazil Current. This one, reverses direction, the seasonal land flow is complicated to think. Here's another geostrophic flow, the ACC. So the ACC is flowing this way because of that pressure gradient. There's a geostrophic flow up in the Arctic. When we go to deeper depths, there's just the ACC that's flowing. These pressure gradients are very small and not coherent. So we now have a, an ability to read from a pressure map and think about velocities. We could have inferred what these pressure anomalies were, not all the way to the sea surface height, but like based on pictocline depression, we could think about the thermal wind, saying that the surface flow is faster than the deep. That's because of the changes in the density as we go down. That's a, the buoyancy has got to be varying on one side of that sheared flow from the other. So we have a lot of pieces to think about with that story, I think. All right, any questions? Uh, to what degree should we be incorporating these types of things into our data? So this paper is focusing on the Ekman. So we're going to, the only case in which the Ekman is intimately, well, the Ekman is intimately related to a lot of this gyre-based stuff. We're going to have another paper where you're going to have a chance to explore all these ideas for the gyres. The Ekman coastal upwelling, Ekman equatorial upwelling is enough for this first paper. So primarily focus on that. You may notice that there is an along the coast current or an under the equator current. And you may think that must be related to the pressure anomaly field. It is. We don't have to deal with that. That part can be kind of on the side, of something you mentioned as you go along. We want to focus on the Ekman transport for this paper. But we're building up the tools so that you're, once this paper is in and we're on to the next one, you're going to have lots of machinery to go after the pressure field, the geostrophic velocity field, link it back together with the Ekman field, link it back together with the curl of the wind stress that gives you the Ekman convergence, and have all those pieces moving together. So the third paper will build on all these pieces. And I will, um, I, as I said, I'll put the answer key up for the homeworks. Um, as soon as I get all the, as soon as I get the last couple in, and then I will um, try and get those back to you fast. And I will definitely get the plans back to you fast for the next one so that you have time. So you can expect the plans back by Sunday. 
so just the day after you give them the name. But the, um, the other stuff and the response to reviewers piece, that's lower priority for, for me and hopefully for you too. Like eventually we'll get to that, but I'm grading the ones that you need back from me first so that they can, so that you can respond to it. Cool. And everybody has found the, well through the homework, everybody found the, at least the wind stress and wind stress curl files and can make sense of those. That's almost enough, that's essentially enough to tell this story just to have that together with the velocity fields. All right, good.